In one of our recent YouTube episodes, Iris DeVroads introduced us to the Washington Rochambeau, Cha Rochambeau Trail, the route through Harford County taken by the Continental and French armies on their way to the Battle of Yorktown. This episode continues our discussion of Harford County sites along that route. From 1774 to 1791, the period of the Revolutionary War, Harford Town, located along the post road that connected Richmond, Philadelphia, and New York, served as the county seat of a newly established Harford County. One key business was the Bush Tavern, which provided lodging, food, and a gathering spot for travelers and leading local men. As Dr. Duroy told us, French troops under Rochambeau camped nearby during this, the Revolutionary War. In 1774, the Bush Declaration, named for the town, an alternative name, a local declaration of independence from England, was signed by a number of prominent county men, ending with, and I quote, the risk of our lives and fortunes. This compelling phrase was later echoed in the final words of the National Declaration of Independence in 1776, and it now serves as our Harvard County motto. I'm Jackie Seneshaw, and on behalf of the Historical Society of Harvard County, I welcome you to this afternoon's presentation, Archaeology of the Bush Tavern and Surrounding Neighborhood. Before we get started, I want to ask you to take a moment and hit that subscribe button on your YouTube screen. The Bush Tavern still stands along the old post road. We call it Route 7 in Abington, and it, today it serves as a doctor's office. In 2016, archaeologists from the State Highway Administration began an archaeological dig at the site. Our speaker today, Aaron Leventhal, was the lab director for the dig. In his presentation, Aaron will share find his findings and that of others invo involved in this exploration of Harford's historic past. Aaron, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Leventhal. I'm an archaeologist with M.SHA, and the presentation I'm going to give you is called the 2016 to 2018 M.SHA Archaeological Investigation of the Bush Tavern in Harford County, Maryland. Um, between 2016 and 2018, M.SHA, assisted by Rommel, Klepper, and Call, completed an archaeological investigation of two sites along Maryland 7 and Bush. And it was part of a landscape study of the intersection of Maryland 7 and Maryland 136 focused on sites located along the historic transportation route. The two sites archeologically investigated were the Bush Tavern and the Stone Chimney House. Both sites are on the Northwest side of Maryland 7 and the Stone Chimney House is just Southwest of the Tavern site. They're both 18th century sites. The Stone Chimney House in 2016 is the photo on the left and circa 1910 is the photo on the right. Notice the interesting well sweep off the left side of the 1910 house. This is the Stone Chimney House in 2016. Oh, I'm sorry, the Bush Tavern in 2016. This is the Bush Tavern circa 1930s and circa 1950s. Notice the building to the rear in the left of the frame circa 1930s. This is the Bush Tavern circa 1910. Notice the frame building left of the child in the picture. And we're gonna talk about this building and other additions shortly. So the tavern building stood during the late 18th century when Rochambeau camped here on the 10th and 11th of September and the 24th through 29th of August, 1782 during the march to and from Yorktown. And the stone chimney house is contemporary with the tavern building. The investigation of both sites included a geophysical survey comprised of GPR and magnetometry. Geophysical survey at the Stone Chimney House didn't reveal much archaeological potential. Not many features were detected. Likely, this is a result of modern landscape redesign, modern utilities construction and maintenance, modern garage construction, and the like. 29 shovel test pit excavations were dug at the Stone Chimney House and 300 artifacts were recovered from the site. 
It was recognized that much of the yard space around the house was thoroughly disturbed. There was only one small discrete area of intact 19th century yard service identified and no high potential historic anomalies were detected. And due to these results, no more archeology span was completed at the stone chimney house and the site was recorded as is. The geophysical survey of the Bush Tavern showed quite the opposite though. Um, detected were modern utilities like a broad septic field, but also were broad areas of numerous historic anomalies, historic features like burned areas, pits, and buried surface features that could potentially be foundations. 28 shovel test pits and 28 test units were excavated at the tavern and 28 features were excavated and recorded during those excavations. 20 of the 28 archeological features were dated to the 19th century when the building was both a tavern and a residence. And these included three additional building remains, a stone lined well, a privy pit, builders trenches, post holes, and a kitchen midden. 18,130 artifacts were recovered and most dated to the 19th century. And they provided info about how the site evolved and the lives of the people who lived, worked, and visited there. Historic mapping of Bush is kind of scanty and lacking in detail in general. Berthier's 1782 camp map shows both areas occupied by troops and Griffith's 1795 map generally shows what are probably the two buildings on the two sites. Benjamin Latrobe, noted architect, traveler, and naturalist, sketched the Bush landscape in 1813. His view is southwest down the post road, and he noted heaps of tan, which are materials for tanning hides, most likely oak and or chestnut bark, and wooden houses. He also noted Nolan's. Nolan's refers to a second tavern in Bush that was run by Rebecca Nolan, who was the widow of Peregrine Nolan at the time. The 1858 Jennings and Herrick County map shows possibly the tavern in 1858 and little else. Martinet's 1878 County map shows the tavern and likely the stone chimney house as well with a little bit more detail. Here are the locations of the test units we excavated. Our excavation focus was clearly on the massive features in the, in the, in the rear yard. Here are the larger features that we, we uncovered in the rear yard immediately behind the tavern. And from left to right, you've got the kitchen midden in orange, the well in blue, a small square building foundation in red, a building foundation remnant in green, large portion of a large building foundation in purple, and the privy is out of this frame, but it was located to the lower right. The brick floor of a small square building and fill were uncovered during excavations. Um, the floor is waster or reclaimed brick over charcoal and coal ash fill. We excavated the well. It had a 20th century black top cap and it was filled with local soils fairly recently. Um, the test units that we excavated through the kitchen midden um, is typical of the one on the right. And the kitchen midden soil itself is visible in that soil profile. The dark layer is the artifact rich kitchen waste. Um, this material likely came from the kitchen that was located for a time in the cellar of the tavern. And this particular test unit was located right outside the cellar door. In 1956, a 19th century addition was demolished. And this addition may not have been directly attached to the tavern wing. It may have been uh, separate from it by only about a foot or two. The foundation of this addition is this purple outline. So the purple outline is the 19th century addition. Here's a conjectural 19th century well house, which may have possibly be a dairy that also enclosed the well. And here's what's left of the, uh, of the well and the conjectural well house or dairy. Um, 
This may be an outbuilding that predates all I've shown you yet. And it's unclear exactly what the this foundation was for, but it may be related to the early function of the tavern building. I think this is Dr. Holt's son helping Mick Worthington take dendrochronology samples from the Joyce in the tavern basement. Dendrochronology dates confirm the 18th century construction of the tavern. In fact, it was built in the pre-revolutionary period. And it's now proven that the building stood when Rochambeau and troops camped at Bush. Here's a sample of some artifacts that were recovered during the dig. We've got straight pins, safety pins, thimbles, a scale weight, and a bale seal, which is a crimped seal that was placed on textiles, bags, or bales of materials. We got a fairly good amount of toy fragments recovered, as well as plenty of writing implements. Firearms artifacts were in good supply as well, and they range from flintlock age to percussion cap age to, to the age of the modern cartridge. Additionally, there were plenty of beads recovered from the yard. There were also plenty of buttons of every type you can imagine, from 18th to early 19th century metal flat disc buttons to bone buttons to shell buttons to prosser porcelain but buttons to modern plastic buttons. And there are also a decent amount of furniture hardware recovered. And that includes finials and tacks, poles and knobs, and a possible inlay. Um, that's a hand cut copper, copper alloy item that remains a mystery. That's the square item in the center of the right photo. There was a very large ceramic artifact uh, collection recovered. Um, and it, it mostly represents tableware, like large fragments of plates and cups. And much of this material is what archeologists call whiteware and it dates to the 19th century. There was a large amount of redware, food, and food prep and storage vessel shirts recovered, which is no surprise because Lancaster, Pennsylvania is close by as is Philadelphia. And those are two centers where redware is produced in the 19th and 18th centuries. The stemware, suggests consumption of beverages other than beer. And what you see in the, on the right-hand side of this slide are the midsections of the stems of stemmed vessels. Out of the privy came several fragments of the same spittoon. It was octagonal, but it was similar in form to the round variety in the slide to the right. Um, the spittoon's datable due to the leaf motif. Otherwise, spittoons were made for a broad period of time in nearby Baltimore and elsewhere. Utensils were no surprise, recovered digging behind the dwelling near the kitchen entry. And coins were common finds too, and they were all 19th century. Also note the drilled coin, which is an 1831 one cent piece, which may have functioned as a buzz saw toy or a hem weight for a curtain or a dress. If you're not familiar with a buzz saw, that's it on the left. And there are other examples of hem weights on, hem weights on the right. Tobacco pipes were present, um, but they were usually very fragmentary, which isn't surprising since much of the area was high traffic, both historically and currently. Other personal items included uh, combs and parts of a pocket watch. So this is how the building appeared up until the early 19th century. What's not shown is the early outbuilding to the rear. And again, the location of the early outbuilding is right here. This is the location of the early 19th century residential wing addition and the conjectural well house was located at the rear. We didn't investigate the addition because it would have, we would have had to have demolished Dr. Holt's parking lot. But based on what we know so far, um, the foundation and debris fill likely remained beneath the parking lot. Here's the conjectural well house um, and well as we found them. So there's some speculation that the well house was a dairy. The original floor, it seems, was below grade. It was then later filled with coal ash and charcoal and covered in that waster or salvage brick. 
So dairies need a water source to function, which could be the why the well is so close. The fill may have occurred when the building reverted to storage or another function. Here's the mid 19th century frame L edition. Um, we have photo evidence of this standing. This is that mid 19th century L um, in the 1930s and 1950s. And again, here's the archeological remains of that edition. So here's some tavern timeline details. Um, in, eight, in the 18th century, Bush was the Harford County seat until 1791. So the community was at least modest prior to that date with 14 buildings noted there in 1777. The stone chimney house was owned by the Bush River Ironworks at the time, and it may have functioned as worker housing. Joseph Stiles and later the Nolans operated a nearby prominent tavern into the early 19th century, and it was, no, it was the tavern noted by Latrobe in 1813. Bush Tavern itself seemed to decline into the 19th century, along with the prominence of the community and the use of the post road as the railroad developed nearby circa 1838. In the late 19th century, only six buildings stood in the town. Today, the tavern and the stone chimney house are the only 18th century buildings present. So what we know is the tavern building today functioned as a tavern most likely sometime after 1812, but possibly earlier. The early 19th century South Wing Edition probably served as the James Kelly residence and the North section as the tavern around this time. The well and the well house, possible dairy, was built by or for James Kelly in the early 19th century. The Osmonds then operated the tavern circa 1850s when it was known as the Osmond Hotel or the Osmond Tavern. They built the frame L edition that stood until 1956. It served as living space for the Osmonds, their largely African-American employees or for hotel guests. The property then falls into disrepair from the mid 19th century through the early 20th century. Surprisingly, no definitively military artifacts were recovered during this project. Colonial troops likely camped in the fields rather than immediately in the yards of the dwellings. Officers may have stayed in the dwellings though. Um, much of what of the collection that we recovered from the tavern site seems to be inexpensive material. The Bush Tavern was a modest establishment when it was commercially operated from possibly as early as the 18th century. And in 1876, during the Osman period, it was listed by the IRS as an eighth class hotel, which is the lowest hotel ranking there is. Nolan's Tavern, noted by Latrobe in 1813, seems like it was the highest high end establishment in the 18th and early 19th century, but we don't have comparative archaeology to prove that theory out. The question then remains as to where the 18th century artifacts are located because we barely found any in the, in the yard surrounding the tavern. The site though, as proven by dendrochronology, dates to the pre-revolutionary war period. So perhaps this material has been dumped or deposited beyond the current yard bounds. It could be that the, during the 18th century, prior to the tavern period, the building functioned as a conspicuously high grade dwelling, representative of the status of the ironworks ownership or the ironworks management. And at this time, refuse disposal would have taken place in areas far from those formal yard spaces, out of sight from travelers who were traveling on the post road or on Calvary Road. The dwelling in the yards would have looked distinctively different from the dwellings of in the yards surrounding workers' housing, like the stone chimney house. So, Let's watch this video of the evolution of the Bush Tavern. And this was created by a company called Direct Dimensions, who was under contract with M.SHA. So this is um, the site of the tavern before it was constructed. Right around the period of the American Revolution. early 19th century when it began to function as a tavern, we know for certain.
mid 19th century with the well house and the addition. Here's uh, how it probably looked during the early 20th century when it was in a period of rapid decline. Mid 20th century after the demolition. And here's current condition. That's Dr. Holt Fox. Well, and Aaron, we to... thank you so much for that. I've learned a lot as I've as I was watching you go through this. Um, a couple of questions that come to mind, um, Emma, as I was listening to your description, it sounds like what you're saying essentially is that this building started as a private residence. At some point, it was converted to a tavern, and in the mid 19th century it was fairly there was a family that lived there it was a tavern it was it was probably its most active period and then things it went into decline and what we're left with now is almost the original building that we started what dr holt's office is now is like the original building that started there is great. that a fair summary of what you just said that is a great summary <laughs> um so if I want to find some documentation other than this wonderful YouTube video of what you all found, is there a written report somewhere um, that exists that we that that a researcher or somebody wanted to learn more about it could go and, and try to find? Yes. So there are copies of the report that are available um, for review, but not for loan at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum outside of Prince Frederick. That's also where I believe some of the artifact collection is. And that is also available for public review. The archaeological report that's down there is a compendium of the historic research that was completed as part of this project. It also contains all of the archaeological analysis of the artifacts and the features. And like I said, this was a landscape study. So there's a discussion of not just the sites themselves, but how they functioned in the landscape and how they functioned in um, the, the village of Bush, town of Bush or Harford town. What was the most surprising thing that you learned or found in this, in the, in, during, the, during the dig? Well, I think to me, I went into this project thinking that we weren't going to find very much because it seemed that the modern development of the yard, um, like the stone, stone chimney house, um, had really impacted the archaeology because there's a above ground septic in the rear yard that's real prominent. And uh, once we got the uh, results back from the ground penetrating radar and uh, <clears throat> magnetometry survey, it showed that for, you know, as luck would have it, the archeology span was well-preserved. And then to find the sequence of so many buildings intact only less than a foot below the ground surface was really surprising. Um, you mentioned that it's entirely possible that under the existing parking lot, you still would have the remains of, you know, that addition that was built in the 1800s as well. Mm -hmm. That makes yeah. sense. That makes it sense. seems to be that the case. And so um, the existing parking lot just caps, caps it. There's really no elevation change between the parking lot and the current yards. So it doesn't seem like it was scooped out or filled in. Um, I bet you, if you peel back that upper layer, you'll probably see the outline of that building. Well, that would be an interesting another layer of study. Now you, in your discussions, you talked about a well, and then you talked about an adjacent dairy. 
Can you talk a little bit more about what a dairy in the 18th, in the 18th and 19th century would have been and what its function would have been? Well, it seems like that square building next to the well would have been a dairy. It's a convenient location because the kitchen of the of the building was located in the cellar and there's direct access to the backyard. So you would want to have all your food processing and storage facilities close to the kitchen. Um, so in general, a dairy, which is also known as a milk house, is a, a covered building that's usually uh, the floor of it is excavated to below grade so that um, dairy products can remain cool because this is all pre-refrigeration. Um, you need to have a well close by because you need to keep things clean. And so water, fresh water from a well is there to keep, the, to keep um, sanitation convenient. So would the water from the well then be used in the dairy? The water from the well would have been used to keep things in the dairy clean because the last thing you want to do is get a vessel holding you know the day's cream or milk dirty oh yeah the next thing you know things go sour okay because i'm familiar with um in the more rural areas the county spring houses mm -hmm. which generally were built over top of a spring they had a an excavated canal if you will into mm -hmm. which the water from the spring flowed, that was obviously cool. And then you'd put your milk or whatever product you needed chilled right. in that, and the water would keep it chilled. Right. Yeah, we didn't find any evidence of a spring spring terribly close by. So we figured that this could be, it's it's conjecture that this was a, was a, a, a dairy, okay. but it, seems, it doesn't seem like it's, it seems like it's more than a coincidence that the, the two structures are so close together. That said, this could very well have been a laundry. Okay. And you didn't see anything in the artifacts either way or the other that would help you to characterize the function of the building? No, because really our excavations were in kind of a concentrated area. So you've got a, a lot of different activities going on in a small space. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. overlap. So, you know, if we found, um, let's say a dairy building, you know, 50 feet away from a dwelling, most likely you'd only have ceramic, ceramic artifact, or you'd have a large collection of ceramic artifacts surrounding that dairy that would include churns and milk pans and items like that. <clears throat> So we do have artifacts like that, but um, they're mixed with uh, refuse coming again out of the kitchen from the cellar, um, items that are dropped by people walking from the frame addition into the house, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of mixing. That's what it sounds like. Carol, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Aaron, could you... For those of us who are not as familiar with archaeological terms, could you explain, explain a little bit about uh, what encompasses a geophysical uh, exploration? So the geophysical survey that we used on this site included ground penetrating radar and magnetometry. So ground penetrating radar is basically like uh, an x-ray machine that you push over a site. And it's, you can think of it as an x-ray machine X-ray machine on a lawnmower. So it's on a cart and they push it over the site in a, in a grid and they're able to get essentially an x-ray of what's below the ground surface. Magnetometry um, is about, it uses the same process with the grid and the sled or the cart, but it's like a metal detector it um, will detect concentrations of, of metal artifacts, but also areas where there's been a lot of burning. I was surprised in your presentation that you didn't note any uh, Native American artifacts because uh, we've always uh, seen Route 7 as uh, the original uh, Native American trail. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you think it would be, if if you were to go down further, that that may happen, or they've just been destroyed over time. 
I think there are likely Native American sites in the area, and they're probably closer to the drainages nearby. Okay. I, I'm not, I also think that this is an area of, of really intense historic activity. So if you moved out into the farm field or farther out into the yard where the historic activity is not so intense, then you may find some Native American material, but you'll definitely find it closer to the drainages. The uh, the last question I had, uh, the this uh, project was funded by the Maryland Department of Transportation. Can you explain how they get involved and uh, why uh, why they would be doing a uh, archaeological dig in this location? Well, usually when there's state or federal money involved in a project, there are different levels of of review that go on behind the scenes. And one includes what we call a cultural resources review. So you've got to look at the impacts that a development would have on um, historic resources like above ground resources, or historic architecture, or below ground resources like archeology. span um, And because that intersection has had issues in the past, uh, the landscape study kind of fed into the developments that are planned for the future. I think it's wonderful that these things are done because otherwise we would lose them completely. And Bush was such an important part of Harvard's history. So thank you very much for doing this. Absolutely, you're welcome. Um, I wanna thank you very much for being with us today. Um, and I would just want to share a couple of things about upcoming activities for our viewers um, before we end. So let me tell you that um, uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the village of Bush um, and the relationship and the activities that happened there um, that had influences nationally, um, I direct you to two historical bulletins that the Historical Society has for sale. Uh, the one is on the Bush Declaration tablet, and the other is on Harford County's role in the development of the Bill of Rights. Um, today's event is uh, one of an ongoing series um, that's available on our YouTube channel. Um, as I said, the most recent one was on the Washington Rochambeau Trail. Uh, an interview with Dr. Iris DeRode um, and other activities upcoming, other events upcoming at the Historical Society include uh, the annual Geo Geo genealogy conference. There we go, that word, um, which come, is taking place on October the 15th. That will be an in-person event at the Historical Society, which is at the intersection of Main Street and Gordon Street in Bel Air, 124 North Main Street. Uh, the following weekend, October 22nd, is another in-person event at the Historical Society. We're excited about this because we're just coming out of the pandemic, and these are our first, among our first in-person events since then. We have a yard sale, as well as a volunteer open house, uh, which for those of you who have not been to the Historical Society before, includes a little tour of at least the research library, and you might even get a glimpse of some of the construction ongoing for the new museum of Harford County that's under construction in our lobby. Uh, November 3rd is uh, the Archer Lecture, um, and it will be um, by Judge Bill Carr. He'll tell us the inside story of Harford County's courthouses, judges, and lawyers. Um, Judge Carr has been able to arrange for this talk to be given in the ceremonial courtroom in the original courthouse or in the old courthouse uh, on Main Street in Bel Air. Uh, its address is 20 West Cortland Street because that's where you actually access the building. Um, but this is the big red courthouse on Main Street. And finally, uh, in November, we will have another one in these series of episodes, and it'll be on the Concord Point Lighthouse in Harvard de Grace. Our speaker will be Carol Allen. Um, so I thank you all very much for joining us. I thank you, Aaron, for being with us this, morning, this afternoon uh, to share with us uh, your findings.
Um, and I invite all of you to participate in the Historical Society. Visit our website at www.harvardhistory. There you'll find information on becoming a member of the Historical Society. We encourage you to donate to the Historical Society if you've enjoyed this talk. Um, and we encourage you to visit us to find out more about other events that we'll be having. And again, if you haven't done so already, please click that little subscribe button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much.